I'm Hannah Daly, one of the historians here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Um, today I'm going to be talking about, uh, speaking about atomic veterans, um, which when I first came across the term, I had never heard of it before, uh, which surprised me because I study military history, um, thought I'd kind of touched on everything, at least a little bit. Um, so I was researching a potential oral history interviewee uh, who used the term in his memoirs. Since then, I have done uh, quite a bit of research and have a very wonderful working relationship with Keith Kiefer, who is the current commander of the National Association for Atomic Veterans. Um, but what is an atomic veteran? The VA's official definition uh, states that it is someone who served between 16 July 1945 and 30 October 1962, and during their time in service was exposed to radiation. Uh, there are several different um, government agencies that define it slightly differently based on dates. Um, the VA states don't include the Anawitak Atoll Radiological Cleanup Crew, um, who served from 77 to 1980 and um, were certainly exposed during their time of service. And so going back to um, the first interviewee that uh, I found, I guess. Uh, so F. Lincoln Graffs. So he uh, enlisted in the Navy in 1942. He didn't wait for the draft. He was eager to get in. He thought the war was going to last a lot longer. Uh, he served aboard a tug in the Pacific. And then when the war was over, he still had to finish out his time of service. So post-World War II, uh, Mr. Graffs was assigned to the USS ATR-40 and he participated in Operation Crossroads. All right, so Operation Crossroads was something I had heard about, um, but maybe wasn't quite sure immediately. Um, so Operation Crossroads is a series of nuclear tests at the Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific um, that were done in 1946. So, the natives on the Bikini Atoll and in Inuitak were removed off of the islands so that the U.S. could perform these nuclear tests and continue to study them. Um, Abel and Baker were both detonated. Um, they tested nuclear weapons on naval warships in particular. And so Mr. Graffs, uh, he was situated um, about 10 miles or so out from the detonations, and he witnessed Abel and Baker. Um, after these detonations, uh, they were living life as normal on the ships, and they would actually pull the water from the lagoon to um, clean with, to brush their teeth with, and to cook with. So these atomic detonations were within 10 to 20 miles of the ships. And so when Lincoln Graffs, F. Lincoln Graffs returned back to the States, he had a very unique experience, um, which if you'll play the first clip, he talks about. I got this big abscess on my face. And so I reported into Oak Knoll Naval Hospital and when I checked in at Naval Hospital, um, among other things, they gave me a complete physical examination. They found I, I had a high fever, and I also had a crazy white blood count. And they did what was common to do in those days, gave me massive do doses of penicillin and it didn't touch it. Uh, and so after several days um, in the hospital, oh, every day a doctor would come in with a whole parade of other doctors following him, and uh, the guy in charge would say, now, this is the interesting case I've been telling you about. So I'm an interesting case. But penicillin didn't do anything for this. So one day the corpsman comes in and says, okay, I'm, 
I'm wheeling you down to uh, X-ray. So they take me to X-ray, and they put a lead lead shield over my eye, and they hit me with a, a shot of X-ray. And I go back to my room. Next day, they come in and they give me another shot of X-ray. And this commander, who was a doctor, said, son, when I was a country doctor, we'd call this a hair of the dog that bit you. And I figured out that was his way of telling me what he wasn't supposed to tell me. The hair of the dog that bit me was a little bit, bit of radiation. And so he had a very unique experience. Um, and they never really explained to Mr. Krauss what had happened. Um, but after they did complete the two tests in the Pacific, when they returned to the States, um, there was a large area roped off on the main deck um, from nobody could go on that area on the ship. Uh, they said it was too hot, that it was contaminated. Never mind that they're all still living on the ship at the same time, but that was the case. And as we have continued the tradition of doing Navy days to this day, uh, F. Lincoln Grass was on his ship during a Navy day and they were stationed at Pearl Harbor, it happened to be there. Um, Navy Day is when civilians can go aboard naval vessels, and it's actually pretty cool. So if you've never done it, you should definitely try to. Um, but this particular Navy Day, everyone, civilians, were boarding all the vessels around them, and their ship had a sign that said no visitors um, because they were considered too contaminated, too hot, but the whole time all of the sailors were still living aboard the ship. All right, so moving into the 1950s, um, we're gonna look at Operation Castle, which was another series of nuclear tests. So this one was a series of high yield thermonuclear weapon tests. Um, six hydrogen bombs were detonated at the Pacific Proving Ground, um, specifically in a Weetok and the Bikini Atoll. I believe this is possibly the first successful hydrogen bomb test. And Yes, so sorry, yeah. Um, so Ronald Benoit, uh, who grew up during World War II, he was drafted into the army in 1953 and trained as an MP, a military police. So he and 29 other MPs were sent to the, sent to the Marshall Islands. Um, he was aboard ship with other servicemen to witness these hydrogen bomb tests. Um, afterwards, after the test was over, all of the servicemen would be put below deck and the ship was then washed down. Um, by washed down, I mean, it was an attempt to kind of clean the radiation from the nuclear fallout off of the vessel. They were taking water from the Pacific Ocean and reusing it. Now, since Benoit was an MP, his job was to stay by the doors and make sure none of the other servicemen snuck out or tried to open the door during this process. Unfortunately, he was stationed outside the door during this wash down process. Um, and here we have a bit of his experience of watching the hydrogen bomb um, and then his experience of returning to Anuwe Talk. If you'll play the next clip, please. When that bomb went off, we had glasses. He couldn't even see the sun with them, like welding glasses. I went to take them off. I seen the bones in my hand and the guy in front of me a skeleton. And you don't, you don't forget it, believe me. From the radiation, it's, it's fantastic. And the, well, the bomb was 1,000 times bigger than the atomic bomb. I mean, you can imagine that. What the, you know what the atomic bomb killed a couple hundred thousand people in Japan. This was 1,000 times bigger. Okay, well, oh, yeah. He pulled back into Anna we talk, and the first ones off the ship, you would think would be the scientists, 10 MPs, because we were so, and we took they, all our clothes off. They had a decontamination barge alongside the ship, took all our clothes off, went on the island. They, I took about 
30, 40 shower, 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 take, go take another one, go take it. They kept checking us radiation. So, you know, it was something. We got contaminated. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I have breathing problems from it still today. You know, I ended up in the hospital for four days and I tried to get the records. I said, how come it doesn't show I was in the hospital for four days? When. Um, and then sticking with the 1950s, uh, we're going to focus on Ken Holmberg. He uh, joined the Navy in 1956. He served aboard the USS Lawrence County LST-887, uh, stationed in the Marshall Islands. So at that time, they were still doing testing on the, at the Pacific Proving Grounds. Um, Operation Hardtack was in 1958, and it was again atomic explosions being studied. Uh, so they were studying many different things. Uh, one of the things they wanted to see was how an atomic bomb would affect an underwater mine. And so they had these giant blocks of wood they secured underwater mines to, floated them out during the test, and then would, after the test, gather them up, put all the contaminated material on the deck, and bring it back to Honolulu. Um, Holmberg talks about how swimming was allowed in the Marshall Islands, that was fine. Um, however, they were not uh, allowed to consume the coconuts, the bananas, or the fish. You could fish for fun, but you were not to consume the fish. Um, there was a two hour countdown to each detonation, which apparently was pretty exhausting after a while. Um, and Ken Holmberg witnessed 12 separate detonations, which is amazing. Um, so. If you'll play the next clip, you'll kind of see what it was like for him and his experience. When, when a bomb was going to be detonated, we all had to stand on the main deck and turn our backs and put our hands over our eyes. And they, and they said, do not look at that detonation. Um, and, and the officers had these special glasses, and I got a pair for one, one explosion, and you couldn't begin to see the sun with them. So the first bomb, I had my hands over my eyes, they detonated it, and I could see all the bones in my hand. And I thought, holy balls, this thing is something else. And just say after you count to 10 or 12, and then you can turn around. And the mushroom cloud is going up, and and it's just it's on fire, and and, uh, and they tell they tell us brace yourself. Well, then the sh and I was just standing there, and the shockwave hit and knocked me right on my butt, and I thought, holy balls, <laughs> this is some serious stuff they got here. And uh, every and then. We had this, uh, I don't know, like a sprinkling system put into our, onto our ship. After a bomb was exploded, we'd all go below decks, shut all the hatches, and they'd turn on this sprinkling system. So they were sucking radioactive water out of the bay, because we were in the, the Bay of Anahuita, in Wash. I, I I suppose the purpose was to wash the ship down. I, I don't know, but in hindsight, it didn't. It don't make much sense to a layman like me. And so, when asked about um, you know what he thought about it at the time, or if they talked about it, uh, Ken Holmberg was. Adamant. He said, you know, this was a huge secret. We were not allowed to tell our loved ones what we were doing. We were not allowed to talk about anything in any letters home. Um, he was informed that if he spoke about what he saw or what he was doing, it was a one-way trip to Leavenworth. All right, so moving along, um, the natives that the U.S. government had removed from the Marshall Islands or Inuitak in the Bikini Atoll in order to do this testing um, had expressed a desire to be able to go back home to their homes, um, which the U.S. government had promised that they would do. 
Um, so that resulted in the Anawitak Atoll Radiological Cleanup. Um, this is from 1977 to 1980. And so the idea was that, uh, you know, they needed to remove the radiation from the island to make it livable. So the Bikini Atoll was out. It was too much radiation. They called that a no-go. So um, they changed to shifting to uh, concentrating on cleaning up Anna we talk. So Keith Kiefer, um, who is going to be the next clip in a minute, he was part of this Anna we talk Atoll radiological cleanup crew. Uh, what they were doing was removing 18 inches of contaminated soil and dumping it into um, a crater. So there had been these huge craters from the atomic pump testing. So they were dumping it into Cactus Crater on Runet Island. Um, and then they were going to cap it with a concrete dome. Keith Keeper spent most of his time, he was based on the main atoll, uh, which was codenamed Fred. And he was in communications. So he basically went to every single island during his time of service there. Um, he could fix anything and he, he touched every island. So whatever, whatever was on every island, he's been there. Um, and then if we can play the next clip, which is gonna be Mr. Kiefer's explanation of what it was like, the safety precautions that were there um, and his personal physical reaction to having served at that time. Next clip, please. Me personally, I had absolutely no protection at all. Um, and, and, and the protection that, w that individuals uh, uh, received um, varied from, from the time, during the time of operation uh, and also varied from group to group or individual to individual. Uh, some individuals, uh, they tried to get dust masks uh, or wanted dust masks and, and they weren't available. Uh, they were basically told, uh, take your, you know, if you're concerned about the dust, uh, take your, uh, uh, take your t-shirt off and put it over your, you know, put it over your face. Um, um, there were times that, the, you know, that, uh, a few of the people may have had uh, um, uh, dust, you know, dust masks. Um, um, there were times that some of the people had uh, booties, but uh, the bulk of the individuals doing the work or around, uh, around where they would be exposed to radiation um, had um, little to no protection. Um, the standard uniform uh, for most of the people was a, a pair of cutoff uh, uh, cutoff uh, uh, shorts, um, uh, maybe socks, and a pair of uh, a pair of shoes. Um, most didn't even have a T-shirt on, um, or if they did, you know, if they did have a shirt on, most uh, uh, most might have a T-shirt. Some had radiation badge or dose, dose meter badges, but uh, the majority of the individuals did not. The orders read Inuit Tuck Atoll Radiological Cleanup. And um, um, my initial, you know, reaction was radiation, uh, you know. So I asked some questions and they said, oh, you don't have anything to worry about. You're not gonna get exposed to any more radiation than you would. Um, walking around the city of New York or, or living in uh, Denver, Colorado or wearing a watch with a radium dial. Um, I was young and naive and believed them but yet at the same time must have had uh, some inkling in the back of my mind uh, because uh, even though they didn't do any baseline testing that in retrospect, you would expect somebody going into a potentially radioactive area, you would expect them to have, you know, sperm count, blood work up, uh, you know, physical uh, uh, urinalysis uh, 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 test. Uh, they didn't do any of that. I, on, uh, on my own, uh, went and get, uh, I wound up getting a sperm count, which was normal before I went over. 
um, went over there and, and spent a little less than six months, uh, uh, six months there, and uh, came back. And my wife, uh, during the entire time we were married, uh, um, we never had used any birth con birth control, and she wasn't getting pregnant, wasn't getting pregnant, and uh, that's when I learned that. Uh, um, that my time over there uh, potentially had an effect uh, uh, effect on my health, and, and I uh, learned that technically I was sterile. So um, went on, and, and I continued to have um, um, unexplained uh, illnesses, um, um, deep deep muscle pain. Uh, bone, bone, bone aches, fevers that would come and go without any uh, explanation or be tied to, uh, you know, having a cold or a, or a flu or or some, you know, something like that that you would that you would associate with those type of so symptoms. I'd go into the doctors and and uh, the doctors that you know not have any answers uh, for me as to what the what the cause of it was and. This continued on for, you know, for years. Unfortunately, Keith Kiefer's experience medically um, had become quite common with these men that are considered atomic veterans. Um, F. Lincoln Graffs has had issues um, from 1946 to current. Um, most people have. There are, of course, a few that don't. Um, but part of the problem is that all of these guys had signed some sort of non-disclosure act with this part of their service. They were not allowed to talk about this. So when they went to their doctors with these physical ailments, physical issues, they could not say, hey, I witnessed 12 atomic bombs going off and was within possibly 20 miles, 50 miles of it. Um, it might be radiation induced. They could not do that um, for a very long time. And it wasn't until 1996 under the Clinton administration that that was repealed, that they could then discuss what they had done, what they had seen, what they had been exposed to. Now, it didn't only happen in the Pacific. Those were just the clips that I pulled for today. Um, there were servicemen that were exposed also on the Nevada Proving Ground where there were experiments going on there. Um, either on the ground as MPs, which we have a couple in our collection, um, but other ways. There were pilots that had to try to measure um, different parts of the atomic bomb blast that flew too close. Um, the unfortunate part for me as an interviewer, um, more for them, more for them, but uh, is that because of their exposure to radiation and because of the uh, induced health issues that they have afterwards, that these men are expiring quicker than some of the World War II veterans, which is unfortunate. So it's important to get these stories done now. Um, as I mentioned, Keith Keeper is the current commander of the National Association for Atomic Veterans. If you think you might be an atomic veteran, um, or if you have more detailed questions about that, please feel free to look at their website, which is nav, N-A-A-V.com. Um, all of their contact information is there. They are really wonderful, very easy to work with. Um, but continuing on, what exactly does this have to do with World War II? I think um, it is important to remember, and these men serve as that, that just because World War II is over and ended with, the, uh, with Japan surrendering in 1945, these people are still reminders of that war. They are still suffering. We have World War II veterans that were part of Operation Crossroads that are reminders of the war, that are reminders of our experiments with nuclear energy, um, atomic energy, nuclear weapons, sorry. And so these men and their oral histories show the connection that uh, we are still looking at these weapons. We are still messing with stuff that we had discovered during World War II. And that wars never truly end because the people that experience them are here and 
they're around us and we should always listen to their experience. It's very vital, I think, to the history of the United States of America. Okay, well, that is um, all I have for y'all for today. I think we are gonna go ahead and take some questions now. Right, so I did have a question earlier. Um, somebody had mentioned that her husband had been at, I think, Nagasaki right after the bomb was detonated and that he died a little bit early on and she was wondering if it could have been from radiation. Um, obviously, I'm not a doctor. I can't actually tell you that. But um, from what I've read, Nagasaki, the radiation that you could receive from those sites after detonation, did not last months. Um, from what I've read, it lasted hours into possibly days. Feel free to correct me on that. I'm not quite sure, but um, that's what I read on the internet and <laughs> hopefully that is accurate. Um, okay, any other questions? Uh, the World War II Museum has interviewed about nine of these atomic veterans to date. And no, I have not heard of or interviewed any female atomic veterans. I mean, that's not saying that there aren't any. I'm sure there are somewhere. Does anybody have any other questions? Looks like we have one question in the Q&A, Hannah. Um, Yasmin wants to know, how can we advocate to get justice for the atomic veterans? That is a great question, Yasmin. Um, Keith Keeper with the National Association for Atomic Veterans is extremely well skilled in this. Um, their organization has people spread out all over the country with contact information. So if you happen to be in their area, you can go to their website um, look up the area, find the person. For example, Ronald Benoit is stationed in Massachusetts and kind of takes care of that cluster of states. Um, they will help you try to get benefits. They are very skilled at it. Um, and yeah, it's a great route to go. They are a wonderful organization. So the hydrogen bombs were huge compared to the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. They made them look small, which is a bit terrifying when you think about it. Yes, um, some atomic veterans have been given compensation for their suffering. Unfortunately, it is one of those things where a lot of the atomic veterans have passed away before they were able to get said compensation. Um, because the VA limits the definition of who qualifies as an atomic veteran uh, to 1962. It means that some people are not included, including the people who are part of the Anna Talk Atoll radiological cleanup. Um, they are working on expanding that definition with the VA, of course. Okay, um, but yes, any other questions? Okay, well, I think those are all of the questions that we have for today. Um, if you have, oh. I think we have a few more here. I can pull them up. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kate, the distance learning specialist here um, in the Q&A. I can go ahead and pull a few. Um, so Cheryl Crawford wants to know, is there any evidence that any of the atomic vents who went into Hiroshima to examine damage after the explosion had radiation signals? signals? That I am not sure of. I have not personally spoken to any of those veterans. Um, I'm sure that that can be answered possibly through Keith Kiefer if he has had any contact with those veterans, but to my knowledge, I'm not sure. Ernest wants to know, have you ever talked to any of the descendants of any of these atomic veterans? I have yet to do that. Um, right now, what I'm focused on is getting the atomic veterans themselves, their stories recorded now before they pass away. Um, there is a sense of urgency because of their medical conditions. After that, we would start uh, looking at the descendants as a possibility. But it's really the, 
it's really the first person perspective that we look for when we do oral histories at the museum. Awesome. And one question, you may not be able to answer this one, but I think it's interesting. Um, our, and John wants to know, are mortality and morbidity survey data collected by the US government? Um, if any of, about these servicemen and women, was it classified? Is it still classified? Has it been released? I you talked a little bit about Clinton era, but. Yeah, I am <laughs> not qualified to answer that, unfortunately. Um, I know right now, currently, DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, is in charge of uh, giving out certificates for people who think they qualify as atomic veterans. However, those certificates don't actually promise you any benefits. So um, there's a lot of layers to it, I believe, and that's why it's so great having the National Association for Atomic Veterans because they are very familiar with navigating that information. Awesome. And I will end with this question from Joan. Is there any literature you recommend about these experiences? I ended up reading um, F. Lincoln Graffs. He wrote a book. It is on Amazon. If you search his name, he doesn't use his first name, just his first initial, which is F. And then Lincoln Graffs is G-R-A-H-L-F-S. Um, he has a memoir. He wrote a book. It's published. Um, talks about his experience, which pulls from World War II until now. Um, besides that, the NAV people have... Um, they have a letter that they do every month and they do include stories. And so that is all on their website. And so if you're interested, you just have to go through each newsletter. Um, they will feature a story from a veteran each time. It is really interesting. I mean, it's very cool read. Awesome. And we have linked that NAV website um, in the chat for anybody watching. And with that, it looks like we are just, oh, Oh, I have one more question I see in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, so Rusty asked, did veterans volunteer for this assignment? And the answer is no, they did not. This was part of their service. Awesome. Well, I know I learned a lot today and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and Hannah, thank you for joining us and doing this important work. And we hope that you will all join us again tomorrow for our 11 Central program. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.